Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to this session. I would warmly welcome Professor Lewis Gordon. It's a great pleasure to have you with us today as well as all the board and US solutions. I also salute Professor Olomides, who is representing the, the Scientific Council of SESH. I'm representing the Dean of the Faculty of Economics, who is as a Senate meeting. And um, I would now officially start the session. Please, Professor Colomides. Thank you, Professor Jean Colomides. Uh, colleagues, thank you very much. On behalf of the Scientific Board of SESH, I have the great pleasure to introduce Professor Lois Ricardo Gordon. I found out that you are Ricardo. I am Ricardo. <laughs> Not David Ricardo, but Lois Ricardo. As the holder of Bobby Good Souza Science Chair for 2019. It's not easy to carry out this, the task of presenting Lois Gordon as the holder of this chair in a room where the person this chair honors is also present. This chair was created some years ago in a faculty working to the founder and added for several years. The purpose of this chair is to recognize and honor the work of the great scientific importance that would include Sousa Sancho developed as both professor at Faculty of Economics, where we are, and as director of Center for Social Studies, also of Queen University. This chair at the Faculty of Economics is a fundamental instrument and has been playing that role in deepening the international internationalization and through these external connections, celebrating the great prestige of colleagues to the PhDs that we have here and producing dynamism and quality in our training sessions. Finally, I think this chair has contributed throughout the years to mutually reinforce the connections between field and SESH. After all, we have a lot in common, research interests, political projects, and PhD programs. Lois, if I may, is a reference in philosophy, especially if one aims to think about alternative thinking, alternative philosophies. As Boaventura has challenged us in line with Gordon's political and intellectual culture, it is crucial in contemporary times to think from the South and do the South. In his last and fundamental book, Boaventura stresses several key points of the epistemology of the South, explaining his position regarding the Global South, a topic that Lois will address today. In Boaventura's words, the Global South mirrors a constellation of political, ontological, and epistemological aspirations whose knowledge are validated by the success of social struggles against capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. It is therefore an epistemological rather than a geographical South, consisting of multiple epistemologies produced when and where those struggles occur, both in geographical work and in geographical south in different cultural, historical, political, and social contexts. Thinking from the south requires an epistemic decolonization of the work of human experiences, a topic that Lewis Gordon will address today in his talk entitled Theory, Theory Critical, Decolonial, Global, and Otherwise. Lewis Gordon, in his own words, is an Afro-Jewish philosopher, political thinker, educator, and a musician. And on Friday, I can already promise we'll have a very interesting musical encounter. So you are all invited next Friday, Lois and the others. I forgot the name of the group. Three Gs. Three Gs. <laughs> Greg and two Gordons. <laughs> As a diasporic academic, Lois Gordon's life has been shaped by multiple political and academic challenges. I think the quote from his work that is on his page, to have lived in bad faith is to have evaded recognition of oneself as a human being. It is to have lived a fugitive existence. To die in bad faith then is a tantamount to having never lived. And I think this mirrors his political and intellectual posture. Lois Gardner received his PhD from Yale University in 1993, and has since then taught in various <coughs> universities. Currently, is a professor of philosophy with affiliations with Judaic studies, Caribbean and Latino studies, and Asian American studies at the University of Connecticut at Stores. He also holds visiting appointments in several universities, such as University Toulouse Jean Jaurès in France, 
Rhodes University in South Africa, and the University I wish I could visit, West Indies at Mona in Jamaica. That is my next goal. In African studies, Louis Gordon has pursued an expansive concept of black identity that includes not only the United States and Canada, but also Latin America and the multilingual Caribbean as well. In philosophy, one of, I think, most exciting and challenging visible cultures has been the resuscitation of the tradition of existentialism. For Gordon, existentialism is a vital tool in the project of developing a new humanities, a new social theory, ones that can interrogate the Eurocentric roots as a means to bridge across knowledges and peoples to more fully experience diversity of knowledges. Here is in tandem with Boaventura's Epistemology of the Self. Moreover, Lois argues that existentialism is critical for the development of African American thought as well as for an analysis of racism in everyday life. And these arguments are present in several books that he has published, such as Bad Faith and Anti Black Racism, Fanon and the Crisis of the European Man, Existentia Africana, and an more recently, an introduction to African philosophy, just to name a few. Building on thinkers like Fanon, Dubois, and Cabral, Gordon has developed new phenomenological accounts of embodied black and colonial existence. His phenomenology, therefore, does not assume that anybody's lived experience can stand in for the whole. Indeed, as Boaventura also insists, the understanding of the world is much broader than the Eurocentric understanding of the world. Rather, these challenges posed by Boaventura and by Lois recognize that only a multitude of accounts can reveal the complex of cultural meanings distributed throughout different, differentially marked bodies. Gordon's work shows us the example of existential phenomenology can be reformed of its narrow, Eurocentric, male perspective, and though it can continue to provide a powerful theoretical framework within which we can address social and cognitive injustices. As a public intellectual, also, Lois Gordon has written for a variety of political forums, newspapers, and magazines, and among them, throughout, where it also serves as a member of the board of directors, the Pambazuka News, Jonas Book Saloon, the Mail and Guardian, and had lectured widely across the world, as he was yesterday telling us that he even doesn't feel the time differences because it's all over the world. Finally, many of you probably know that Gordon was one of the founders of the Caribbean Philosophical Association, of which he was the first president, and for which he now serves as the chairperson of the Awards Committee common to Boaventura and to Gordon, if I may say, is the desire to dialogue in a world made of multiple words. What Santos calls the ecology of knowledge, as for Santos, the epistemic diversity of the world is infinite, and no general theory can capture it. So, your attention please to Lois Gordon, who will be talking to us about theory critical, the colonial global and otherwise, discussing some problem it detects in some of the existing work in this area, in the role of philosophy to be developed from the South. Thank you. Bom dia. Uh, I visited Brazil, so I do the South Gia. Shalom. Salam alaikum. And some of you know I'm from Jamaica. So, how you keep it? You can clap. <laughs> no, not that beat. You know this beat. Six eight pattern. It's very popular here, as you know, particularly in the Flamingo. I um, first thank you, Ricardo, thank you uh, for this honor. And it's it's not about simply the prestige of the honor. It is about, as I will speak today and Friday, it's also the unique um, beauty and spirit it represents. But first, I just want to make sure that certain people are just acknowledged. Ajao, who brought me here, Paulo Diaz. Ines, so where's Ines? There she is. Costa, for all the work she did. To Thank you to get me here. These things are not easy to arrange. 
Of course, Paolo Maria Paolo Menezes, Alexander Pierre Pereira, Pedro Diaz da Silva, Bruno, 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 Bruno Cinematics. We had a we had a wonderful lunch, and uh, I had to reflect on the popularity of eating um, uh, baby animals in, the weather, in Portugal. Uh, I'm sure an analysis will emerge. Rita Oliveira, the committee who selected me, and of course, Boa, Boa Ventura de Souza Santos. Uh, this is, it, um, in Judaism, you usually name things when people are dead. And uh, so it's fortunately you're not Jewish. <laughs> I'm Jewish. But the, um, but the thing sometimes um, is uh, uh, we should reflect on um, there are some people who face death through not being obsessed with their own life. And people who are willing to take that leap are unique people of love. So I take Boaz's life, because he's always so busy, he doesn't reflect on this, as having pushed aside the question of himself, always for something greater than himself. So the symbol of naming this in, in his honor is actually accurate. It's better to do someone who named it for someone who says, it's not about death or life. It's always about what is greater. And so I think it's appropriate if it's named after him. I also thank you for your generosity because I read Portuguese, but there are many languages I read, but smaller number of languages I speak. But because I could read in some languages, I will speak in an English that I hope uh, would be accessible for those who are not as used to speaking in English. Okay? So thank you for your generosity, because I'm the guest, and, but I, I, I wish I could just with facility, with ease, speak in Portuguese. And I don't want to, of course, butcher <laughs> the language. Uh, thank you also, Paula, for um, bringing up my middle name. When, I, um, when we just met, when I just met, we were, we were, there are two Luises in the room. And many who read my work know I pay attention to linguistic archaeology. The name Luis and Louis, uh, in German Ludwig, goes all the way back to Luta and Lucha. So you already know where this is going. Our name means warriors, right? So I, uh, you have a warrior fighting for your university, <laughs> OK? However, what is Ricardo? Well, Ricardo is a rather grandiose name. It means, it means unfortunately, today it means king. So even though my parents had no idea what these names meant when they named me, somehow they named me Warrior King. But Ricardo is a rather unusual name because it's from Rex. Okay? And Rex, as you know in Latin, for instance, when you think of Tyrann Tyrannosaurus Rex, you think of King Lizard. <laughs> Although in Europe, through Latin, the name refers to a king. Its <laughs> origin is not European. Its origin is in Africa. And it's in an ancient African language, older than most uh, European languages, called Meruneter. Meruneter was the language spoken in much of East Africa up to North Africa. And in Meruneter, Interestingly enough, it's from the word, it, it's often, the hieroglyph is translated as R-X or R-E-K-H, and it's pronounced Rekka or Rex, so you can see connected to Ricardo. And Rekka or Rex made its way through Latin with re, regera, right? And one hopes a king can regulate, you see? But its origin, Rekka, 
Right. It's rather interesting because, I know you're probably wondering, I wasn't planning to do this, but you know, when you do your work, you know these things. But that's rather interesting because it meant not just knowledge. And this is connected to some of the work Boa and many of you do at Chez and the Institute. Okay? Um, it's connect, um, in these ancient languages, there are more words for knowledge than many of us have today in, in um, European languages. Okay? And among the many words for knowledge was rek, reka, reke. And it meant intuitive knowledge into the inner principles of things. Okay? But here's the tricky part. The reket, the people who associated with this knowledge, were such that it was also translated as female ways of knowing. Mm -hmm. uh, so at the moment, for the feminists in the room, right on. <laughs> now what, now, so, some, so this originally female way of knowing, associated, it's not that males could have, because there's a complicated question about males and females in ancient Africa. But how did this word that originally was more associated, there were males who were more associated with females, today is only associated with males. And that already tells you the history of what today we call patriarchy. However, my family, uh, one of the things that Boa and I have in common is we love food. And we love cooking. And we're family. And I'm from a family on both sides of people who, well, women who cook for communities. Okay? And generations back, my, 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 my maternal grandmother, my maternal great-grandmother, my maternal great-great, all of them, paternal grandmother, they all cooked for large communities. But my mother had no daughters. So I am the family cook, chef. I cook for communities. I cook for bar mitzvah celebrations, weddings, many things. And so, in a strange way, in naming me Ricardo, it was symbolic of bringing the female spirit of the ways of knowing around food through this generation. And to give you an idea, what made me fall in love with cooking was when I was a little boy, my grandmother called me into the kitchen and she put my hand into some rice. And she said, let me see if your hands can make rice grow. And you could imagine when the rice came back, all that rice, how a little boy. <laughs> These are special hands. And I never left the kitchen since. OK? So you could already see in that practice that there are many ways to trans, all right, to transfer, to communicate knowledge. And she could have talked about it in biochemical ways of how brains absorb water and blah, blah, blah. But that would not convey the poetry of cooking, the beauty of cooking, the aesthetic dimensions. And so that announcement of my name, gave me an opportunity to tell that story, but also in telling that story, tell another <coughs> story, which is going to be what this, this session's about. Because you see, you notice when I tell the story, the story did not stop in Latin. The story continued <coughs> to a language that was at least 30,000 years old. Okay? So, Here's how I would like to proceed, if you don't mind. I would like to speak in short, uh, this is something I like because Maboko from Ramosa, who is visiting here from South Africa, it's a beautiful thing he does when he talks. He doesn't talk the whole time and then say he'll take questions and answers, and I think that's beautiful. He gives only parts so all the audience could get to talk along the way and it becomes a community discussion. 
Okay? So, the first, what I'm going to do is just start the introductory mark, and then for those who would like to ask, to say some things, we'll go, and then we'll go to each part. Okay? So, introductory remark. The first one is, as so many of you know, that uh, although I have a degree in philosophy, I am not a philosophy nationalist. Okay? I don't think philosophy has the answers to everything. Um, and as I speak to you, you can see I have a lot of problems with, with, with people who think their theoretical position is the answer to everything. Many philosophers, though, are lost in a, a model of philosophy that's a lot like fighting, war, a gono. You have, you have seen that. They go and they want to knock down the other person's argument. Right? So you, you have to show up. They show up. And you go to see who wins. The problem with that model, as every one of you know, especially now that you look at United States. You could look at activities that are being done in Brazil, and um, coming in Venezuela, and in what's happening in India, all over the African continent, East Africa, all over Asia. What many of you know is that it's possible to win a battle and be absolutely wrong. Sometimes the biggest losers are the so-called winners. Because you have now forced people to live with falsehood. When people ask me about my work, uh, although it, it, it looks like many things, I usually just say, oh, my work is about the human being's relationship to reality. In a nutshell. And what that relationship to reality is, is a relationship that human beings often try to avoid. So we could find ways to evade reality, but then we discover that embracing reality isn't very simple. Because we bring things to what we're trying to embrace. And if we have baggage, if our baggage is in fact our methods of lying, then what we embrace could be a radical distortion. Okay? So there's another model. <clears throat> Instead of fighting, another model is showing, demonstrating. But when you show and you demonstrate, what you're doing is trying to make, to, to encourage people to see. You see? And that means with demonstration, it means if it's a community that is to see, it means that one is accountable to evidence, there is humility, but there's also an effort to communicate what is there. And those relationships of communication are crucial because the way many people think of knowledge is unfortunately about throwing the knowledge at people, not communicating with people in the production of knowledge. And this is a very crucial thing. Because if you look at knowledge as a communicative practice, it changes what you are as a person who produces knowledge. So I picked the topic today because many of you in this room are people who are called knowledge producers. You are people living in a world in which there's a relationship to knowledge that poses a certain problems and questions. So I'll begin with the first formulation. Whenever I teach a class, I always ask my students, what is a student? And then I ask them, what is a professor? 
I'm curious, what is a professor, or a researcher for that matter? Anybody would like to tell me? Yes, could you say your name, please? Marilena. Marilena. <laughs> I said to my students that we are the same, that we are both part of the community of people who produce knowledge. Mm -hmm. So there is not much difference between us, between us and them. We are all part of a community of academics, of researchers. Okay. Anyone else? I like that. Implicit in what you said is something I always say that shocks them. What students usually say is, the professor is a know-it-all. <laughs> the students think professors are Moses with the tablets. <laughs> you know, and if they challenge you, you go. <laughs> well, I usually announce, I reject that model. I see what I do and what my colleagues do as the work of advanced students. A professor, I argue, is someone who fell in love with learning and continued to study. This is why we're asked to produce research. It's not simply for the document that we drop, the tablet. It's because if we're producing research, we're continuing to learn. I had a wonderful conversation with Boa and with Paula last night about a wonderful book written by Erica Berman. It's called Frantz Fanon and the Child. And her thesis, she outlines different types of children. Okay? And I'm teaching a class right now called Alienation and Freedom on Fanon psychiatric writings and and we read Erica Berman's book. And I'm, I'm so fortunate because there's a, one of the students in the class is 77 years old. It's a big range of students. They're community activists, they're philosophers, anthropologists, psychologists. And so I asked them a question. I said, How did, when you were 10 and you imagined being 20, you know, what did you imagine? He said, imagine at 20, he'll have it down. I said, how do you feel when you were 20? He said, I felt like a child. So how do you feel when you were 30? <coughs> a child. <laughs> how about when you were 40? Still a child. <laughs> 50? A child. <laughs> and her point, as you can see where this is going, her argument is as long as you understand yourself, not as childish, but as a child, it means you're still growing. And so that, 70, that man in his 70s was in the class because he is continuing to grow. Do you see the point? Well, that is similar with research. Although you may, when you get your PhD or you become a professor, all those are are just acknowledgement of certain stages of learning. It doesn't mean you've stopped learning. And as you continue to learn, what you realize is your students are people who have joined you in communicating and practicing this love of learning. And it also means your students, because they come with different experiences than you immediately have. For instance, you know, many young people today have a different relationship to contemporary technology than I have. You know, I mean, I see three-year-olds who say, oh, that's the smartphone. <laughs> and I'm still, you know, and, but there are other things that they bring that although they may not have the, 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 the accumulation of experiences I have, their different experiences demand a different relationship to the same topic. So in a way, not only are we continued learners and our students learners, but we're co-learners. Okay? And that's a very that's a that's a crucial element because that connects to something that Jane Anna Gordon and I talked about. Uh, many years ago, it's called a pedagogical imperative. Many years ago, I was in a debate 
you're a right-wing conservative, right? most conservatives are right-wing, this is not really right. And he was arguing you shouldn't have black studies. And I asked why, and he said, this was a televised debate, he said, because black studies make people angry. <laughs> And you can imagine my response. <laughs> I was like, What's wrong with that? <laughs> so I brought up a story about anger. When I taught, what the first time I taught a course in contemporary African philosophy was at Brown University, and that was an unusual class. It started with 10 students, the second time 30, the third time 50, and it was a seminar. So after a while, it was a doctoral seminar this size. And what always happened in that class was that the students got angry. But it was a healthy anger. You see, the students, when they took that class, in order to teach contemporary African philosophy, you must always define your terms, and you must communicate how African philosophy relates to Asian philosophy, Amerindian philosophy, European philosophy. In other words, you learn philosophies in the plural. But additionally, the students realize that many concepts that they were being taught in what's called philosophy without African report uh, were not explained. And they even began to realize that although the word wasn't there, what they were learning was European philosophy, or even worse, because a lot of people forget this, European and white are not the same thing. They were learning white philosophy. And the thing they learned, they began to realize that white philosophy is a philosophy that doesn't believe it needs to account for itself. It presumes it is legitimate. You, you know, it's weird when you meet somebody who just tells you, oh, don't worry, I'm intrinsically legitimate. <laughs> Even if you get a party, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> Legitimate. <laughs> I don't need to explain myself to you. You're lucky to be in my presence. <laughs> Maybe you will learn something. <laughs> and you see the problem, right? Because there's no way you could teach African philosophy that way. It's presumed that you have to explain why it is legitimate. If you're going to teach Asian philosophy at Coimbra, you're going to explain what it is, what makes it philosophical, which means you must interrogate philosophy. If you're going to teach Mayan philosophy here, you're going to have to explain why it's philosophy, which means you have to explain what philosophy is, you see? So it turns out the students were angry because they realized they had a lot of questions that were not being addressed in what can, was presumed universal philosophy classes. That was the thing. They were angry, in other words, because they wanted to learn. Now, you know when they would go back and argue with those other professors, what the professors would say? That is not my specialization. <laughs> the problem was, they were with me talking about many things. Uh, what, they, what, you, what they learned is the issue they were asking their other professors wasn't to be specialists in Mayan philosophy, African philosophy. They were asking them, if they love philosophy, to continue studying and at least be competent in what the rest of the world offers. In a way, that's the message of Seth. It is, it, it's a message of not being arrogant about knowledge. It's if you see yourself as learning, keep learning. <coughs> and Jane and I call that the pedagogical imperative. 
it means that all we are, our research is to continue learning. Okay? So that's, that's the first concept. <coughs> pedagogical imperative. It's an imperative to continue learning. So when we say research, it shouldn't be looked at as a daunting, obnoxious thing. It's an invitation to be a continued student. Okay? So I'll pause for a moment. Does anybody want to comment on that? You think we can hear more? Yeah. You think we can hear more? Okay. <laughs> that is okay. That's perfect. Good. Good. Yes, your name? My name is Hetty Malcolmson. I'm visiting Seth. Um, I've got a question about the word love that you're using. So you said that we learn because we love, but I, so, I think that that really depends what you're studying. You might learn because you're an activist, you might hate what you're researching, but do it for activism or whatever. So I just wondered if that shifted a bit, what you were kind of trying to talk about. Thank you for that question. What I would like many of you to do is to hold that question in mind, because that's connected to the later part. The short version is, I, um, you know the way I say we have a problematic conception of philosophy that's a go -no, <laughs> and we have a problematic conception of philosophy that is, we don't say the word, but it's white. Uh, we also, those ways of looking at the world have a problematic conception of love. Okay? And so, at, at the end, I'm going to return to love, but the short version is we're dominated by a, con a model of love that is based on similitude and narcissism. In other words, uh, I love what is my reflection, <laughs> what is like me, what is easier, what's connected. But I argue in my writings that that's only part, that's one kind of love. Human beings also have the capacity to love what is radically different and difficult and challenging. And I think the difference shouldn't actually between love, be between love and hate, but between relevance and irrelevance. Because when we're dealing with things that are not relevant, they may challenge, we, we have a sense of wasting our time. Mm -hmm. However, when you brought up the activist example, the activist, as long as the thing that may not be what the activist loves, but if the activist could see the relevance, that's a different relationship. Because there is something the activist loves that transcends the immediate subjects. That's the short version. Okay. Yes, uh, your name? Lu Lu Gustavo Garcia from Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. visiting HS. Um, I was um, wondering about the role of, of, of the professor, like you, uh, you posed the question, and. My, the thing that came to my mind was, was a guide, uh, and then it came a facilitator. So I was wondering if, if you could reflect a little bit on that role of, of helping others to learn, of facilitating the process of collective learning also in the classroom, in the outside, in the community. Uh, if, if that is also part of the pedagogical imperative of, of a duty to help others and to be part of the collective. The short answer, and you'll see in this, in this presentation, uh, I will offer some um, critical reflections on what on, 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 on approaches or methods that seek for something to be one thing. And I'm glad you asked the question because ultimately a lot of our practices are many things meeting together. And so it's not that there's one correct way to be a professor. It's that there are, we need to be open to the many effective ways we communicate the growth of others. Okay? And so yes, it's, it, it, is, it is that. But the, the, the question for the pedagogical imperative is also an epistemological question because the, 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 what the student is really saying is why do you think what you know so far is all there is to know? You see? 
And so there's an admission, if you continue to be a student, that you're offering what you know, but that what you know isn't all there is to know. And in the process, you're learning more. And so it is a facilitator, but it's also simultaneously, every act of teaching is also an act of research. Not, not the ethnographic model, where the students are objects you study. No, it's the participatory model of continuing the research. That's why, for instance, don't you all get offended sometimes when you, if you've ever taken a class where there's a professor who has the exact syllabus with the exact lecture that's read exactly for the past decade or so? It presumes the world doesn't change and that that lecture contains everything. You know, people are always shocked when, I, when they find out I never actually have a paper that I read exactly every time. Even when I give talks. There was one month I gave 48 talks. They're like, oh, so you did the same? No, said, nope. Mm -hmm. Nope, nope. You start from the topic and you work with the community. Okay? Okay, um, so I, I think I should get now to what the topic is, which is about theory. So let me begin first with um, saying why I chose the topic. I already hinted that it's because many of you are knowledge producers. <clears throat> but I also chose the topic because there are certain crises of theory that are going on. And I think it'll be very, it's very important for us to think about these crises. Just as when I uh, teach a seminar or I um, give a lecture course, I always start with what is a professor, what is a student. If one is doing work in theory, why don't you talk about what, what's a theory? And theory, theory right now is going through a variety of challenges, okay? And um, the, the, so I'm just going to say some of them, and you could nod your head if you're there familiar. Okay. Um, the first problem that I've noticed is that a lot of people in the academy, although although they're, they're, the, the academy has theory and anti-theory people, you know what I mean? I, I remember when I was a graduate student, you know, uh, there was a fellow who said, uh, what are you studying? Philosophy. And the person was an activist. And the, 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 the person said, oh, that's abstract. I like the concrete. And I said to him, well, you know the concrete is an abstraction. <laughs> and who, are, who beats the concrete? We know this glass. This computer, you know, the concrete one knows that. You know. and, um, and so we're already on to something. We had a conversation, you know, about the, so it led to a thing about theory. But the first thing, uh, since that conversation I've noticed, and in a lot of my uh, early writings I was very critical as I witnessed this thing going on. So I'm going to name some things and they should be familiar. One thing is that many people, um, although there are people who are anti-theory, often the people who are anti-theory think the people who do theory are the people who are smart. When you say you do philosophy, when you say you do theory, I mean, you can say you do physics, people think you're smart, but you say you do theoretical physics. <laughs> you could just feel the bulge <laughs> Theory, and, and you know, and, and, and so we already see a, an obvious logical consequence. Because, you know, most people who are academics, there are rich people who become academics, but most academics are not are from people who are rich. And that means their only capital 
what got them in that position. In a nutshell, is that a bunch of people said that they are smarter than other people. And this is what leads to the temptation to be Moses with the tablet. And once you're among other smart people, now you've got to show you're smarter than other smart people because you'll get more knowledge capital. And so somehow along the way, theory became a kind of knowledge capital. And so even people who are not actually theorists sometimes say they are. But when you speak with them, and tell me if this is familiar, what they often say, what they often do when they say they're doing theory, is they state actually a position, and then they connect the position to a famous, often European and white theorist. So my position is against patriarchy. I read Foucault. My position is that I believe in class equality. I look at Althusser or Marx or, you know, Gramsci. And the list goes on, okay? Um, and so what they end up doing when they present theory is they talk more about a theorist. They talk more about Foucault or Derrida uh, and, 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 and in some cases, there are some people who will be highly relevant that they don't talk about because those theorists are not part of the current, the currency, if you will, of knowledge capital. For instance, a lot in the world today is, is a, 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 a person from this peninsula of high relevance is Ortega y Gazette. And you rarely hear him brought up even though his ideas are highly relevant to the rising to the rising of global fascism, and his ideas are highly relevant to talking about knowledge producers, but he's not brought up. Another person, for if we just want to name names, could be Arabindo, Sri Arabindo from India. His ideas around the the different dimensions of mind. It's highly relevant to what we're talking about with artificial intelligence and culture today. And there are others. It could be Zarayako from 17th century Ethiopia. All right? Or if we're talking about questions of violence in the world today and whether you can hand people freedom, a person who is highly relevant is a woman by the name of Yi Yen Jian from China the end of the 19th century. But you see, right now I gave you names. I didn't give you any theory. That's you know, okay? So at least you know I know some very famous theorists. But that's not theory. You see what I'm, I'm getting at? So what I just outlined in this beginning part is a, is a peculiar problem. Okay? And, and, and the problem is the co-modification of theory. It's when theory has become a commodity that you could sell. And the moment theory is a commodity to sell, it raises the question of what we call the colonization of theory. Okay? In other words, it becomes not theory of the market or theory of commodities. It becomes the market of theory, the commodity of theory. And this question of commodification already brings up, and uh, in my argument, it's not one source of cologne of colonizing of a practice. This is just this is one among others, okay? But this one is is rather crucial because it's connected to larger forces we're dealing with today. If we look for instance about even the way we talk about markets, there's been a colonization of markets by a specific way of talking about markets. Um, yes, uh, the chair connects economics with sociology with other things. Many people today, especially lefties, treat talking about markets in any positive way as evil. However, what they're, what they're doing is collapsing into the same fallacy of thinking 
that philosophy equals white, well, is to think market equals capitalism. Capitalism is a specific position on markets, which is to conflate markets with the market, the abstract market over all other markets. It's to turn an abstraction into a god that dominates all other markets. And what is lost is the complexity on creativity of different ways people organize exchange. People have been exchanging ideas for more than 150,000 years. Many parts of the world, markets are predominantly women who are governing them, and they have different aims. Some markets, the main goal is actually to meet people, to gather on a weekend, and you might leave with something, but it's to get news from other communities, to learn, to see old friends. Those are markets. However, the abstract market says no, it should become pure efficiency, profit, and you're supposed to leave with more currency than, sure, than you began with, you see? And that is a confusion of markets, similar to the confusion around philosophy, similar to the confusion around knowledge. And once that happens, when the market becomes a god, the market then has a theodicy. And for those of you who don't know, are not familiar with theodicy, many of you may have had this argument because many of you may have grown up with religious parents, where you say, you know, why is there so much evil in the world? Why is there injustice? You know, if there is a God, why does God make such crappy things happen? And you know, there's some parents who are like, don't blaspheme. <laughs> You're talking about God now, don't. He said, no, no, I mean, why? And, they, and there are two classic responses. They go all the way back to St. Augustine, but Leibniz, all these people, Zaryakov talked about it, everyone. The two classic responses, you all, you've all heard them. Classic response number one, God is infinite, you're finite, you don't know what you're talking about. The problem isn't God, the problem is you. Okay? Classic response number two, God is actually so loving that God gave you free will and you, terrible human beings, screwed things up. Okay? So in both instances, God is kept perfect. Well, in, a sec in secularization, we may have said we put God out, but we've replaced God with other systems. And if we make it the market, or natural science, or um, we could go to a long list, the society, or it could be neoliberal, it could be constitutionalist, you could put anything in there. If you maintain the theodicy argument, it means you treat whatever you put in there as perfect, so the wrongs uh, cannot address that thing. In short, capitalism is perfect, the problem is us. You see? And the solution is always, if you could just let capitalism, in this case, like the God, govern us, control us, then everything will be perfect. And that's why capitalism, as a theodicy, must radicalize commodification. It must radicalize oh, dragging everything into the market. And that's why today we talk not about politics of the market, we talk about the market of politics. We don't talk about uh, knowledge of the market, we talk about the market of knowledge. You see? And so what happens with theory is that we begin to talk about the market of theory. And that's why that problem of theory, that's one of the crises of theory. Because it means the theorist is not actually beginning with the aim of what a theory is to produce. The theorist is actually marketing the marketability of the theory. And that's why you have marketable theorists and positions. Okay? 
But you notice I said before the marketability of politics. Now this is where it gets rather interesting. Because you see, if you can make political identity into a commodity, then the theorists may attempt to make the theory marketable as political. And that is why you have many academics who claim to be, through theory, political and are thus more marketable. And this creates a serious crisis for theory. And in fact, when I was writing about this early in my career, a lot of people were outraged because I was arguing that the theory, the theoretical models that were dominating the academy at that time were absolutely compatible with neoliberalism. Now some don't do it, um, some are, are unashamed. So analytical and positivism, positivist theories, say, oh yeah, they're perfectly marketable. They get the big grants. Right? In the US, analytical philosophy is an example. You know, uh, no matter how, you know, they're always selling <coughs> themselves as <coughs> marketable for the grants. But the truth is analytical philosophy was supported by the Cold War. So even though their classes may just only have two or three students, they were supported by the state and protected. But when the state retreated and people are saying, yo, you need some students in that classroom, it was in a crisis. But the problem is, uh, because they're linked to the to capital and the state forces, they could lie about reality and maintain their hegemony. However, there is another way of thinking of theory that is associated with the left. And at that time, instead of analytical and positivist theory, it was post-structuralism, in post-structuralism, textual post-structuralism like deconstruction, genealogical post-structuralism as you could find in Foucault and others, etc. And they saw themselves as anti-essentialists, resistance to the system, etc. And I argue they're completely compatible with neoliberalism. Now, we today, right now, are, are in the future. So when I was having those arguments back then, um, there, was, there was no empirical evidence to show for this. You know? However, we are now after more than 40 years of the most powerful locations of theory in the academy having been post-structuralism. And what did we see emerge under their watch? The neoliberal academy. <coughs> you have individual stars, individuals who may have resources, but in the end, somehow that model of theory did not, did not, and it about itself as political, address the political storm. And this created a profound crisis. So what do we find today? How, I'm curious, raise your hand, how often today have you seen a major theorist come and announce herself or himself as a post-structuralist today. No hand is up. When I was having that argument, at least nine-tenths of the room would be up. And, and, and the, the, the other one-tenth would be, well, and, 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 and I'm sorry, eight-tenths would be up, and another one-tenth would be the, the classical Marxists. <laughs> you know? Like, I'm not for this stuff, right? <laughs> and then there will be the positives, right? So what happened? Well, here's an example. Raise your hands. How many of you today, when a major theorist visit, you would hear the major theorist call her or himself a critical theorist? 
Fuck off. <laughs> ah, you notice it, the hands go off. How about this one? A decolonial theorist. The hands go off. Okay? And here's what's rather interesting. If you go and look carefully at the people who are calling themselves critical theorists today, and look at their writings, pay attention to the writings. You know what they are? Textual post-structuralists. It's replete with textual post-structuralism. And if you look at a lot of people today, and again, but you notice I say a lot, I didn't say all, just to be careful here, I did not say all, who say they do decolonial theory, look at the arguments carefully. They're identical to genealogical post-structuralism. So that should tell you something. Post-structuralism is no longer marketable. It's ashamed of itself because it has been historically a political failure. But the practitioners continue with a new branding. They've renamed it. Okay? Because there are real dissatisfactions. Okay? Why do I say critical theorists tend to be textual post-structuralists? If you look at a lot of what those critical theorists do, they do the same thing as the textual post-structuralists did before. They announce a position, they announce a theorist, and they carefully examine the text of that theorist. And it's not like Frankfurt School critical theory where you know you would look at Adorno, Marcuse, Fromm, etc. It's, but it's, it, you know, they're new names, but it's the same practice. When you look at decolonial theory, you see, uh, if you look at the way genealogical post-structuralism was, it showed what we could call regimes of power and their relationship to knowledge. Okay? How the production of certain kinds of knowledge produced certain kinds of power. If you look at decolonial theory, knowledge and power have been replaced by coloniality. And coloniality shows how what's called colonization shifts into what's called coloniality to produce what? Forms of knowledge and power. It's the same argument. However, there is a difference. Simply saying there's a repetition does not necessarily mean the same. You see? Because, remember, the contemporary critical theorist is responding to the dissatisfaction of post-structuralism. The contemporary decolonial theorist is responding to the dissatisfactions of genealogical post-structuralism. Well, one of, there are two obvious dissatisfactions in, in, in earlier post-structuralism. Dissatisfaction, one, it tended not to talk about colonialism. Right? So you could say at least these people are talking about colonialism. And that's a good thing. Dissatisfaction number two, which is the lesson learned by the decolonial theorists, but not the critical theorists. The decolonial theorists hit head on the problem of Eurocentrism. And because they hit head on the question of Eurocentrism, they must have a conversation with the global south, with people, with indigenous populations, etc. And that's why, if you go to a meeting on decoloniality, the demographics, the, the diversity in the room would be greater than if you said critical theory. Okay? That's just true. You know, I don't need to go, you know, you've seen it. You've been to those meetings. You, you see it. Okay? Um, however, we come to, and then I'll pause for some, some discussion before I go to the next part. We come to the major problem that both critical theory and decolonial theory fail to address. 
<laughs> and that is, um, although in their practice they talk about it, they haven't radicalized the discourse about it. Most, if you, everyone if you notice, even this discussion is an example of it. A lot of theory is talk about theory. Meta theory. Theory of theory. Right? And so the question that critical theory has, and the question that decolonial theory has, is whether decolonial theory is itself an exemplification of the colonization of theory. It's what critical theory faces to. And this is a very complicated question and because it raises something of which I'm very critical methodologically. Because once that question is raised, an obsession of the theory in trying to show that it is pure emerges. It wants to cleanse itself. And the theory collapses into the moralization of theory. Yeah. A lot of what people call theory today is pure moralization. It's to look at people and almost treat them as if they've done something wrong. If you notice people can't really, they look at you like you're an evil person according to the way you do theory. If you could just cleanse yourself of your evil. <laughs> and this affects even political practices. Because uh, there are many parts of the world today where people say, we're going to have a meeting, a political meeting. So they walk in. But a lot of the people who walk in have declared themselves political from reading a theory. So there are people who say, I'm a feminist because I read Bell Hooks. I'm a black revolutionary because I read, you know, um, whoever is the latest hip person in black thought. Uh, you know, they'll name the person. Or they may read a Fanon. You know? And they all come in, but then they start arguing with each other about who, by virtue of her or his identity, is morally appropriate to be in the room, which is linked to the theory. So then they've got to get rid of those who are not theoretically, which is actually morally correct, even though it's a political meaning. And so what happens is a process of elimination occurs until the only person who is morally correct is the person who called the meeting. <laughs> and then she or he now has to find out if he or she is morally pure enough, correct enough, and if not, they've got to go outside and end it. Okay? Because it, it's a purging. It's a theodicy. You see my point about theodicy? There is a theodicy in that way of doing theory. That is a big problem. When the theory starts turning too much onto itself, it collapses into the practices of treating itself like a god. And you've seen this. I've gone to meetings where critical theorists just spend all their time trying to figure out, yeah, are they the appropriate critical theory? Decolonials are trying to tell you, are you decolonial enough? But we could have, you know, and there's other forms of theory. There are feminist theorists who try to argue who is feminist enough. There are black liberation theorists who's arguing who is black and revolutionary. Everybody is always not enough. And you know it's the problem. You can never be enough. Why? Because we're human beings. <laughs> human beings are by definition, right, the emergence of imperfection. There's a little secret reality always. We, we hide from ourselves with our reality. Reality would have been perfectly fine without us. <laughs> well, look, you know, the temperature didn't have to have cooled, and there could have not been a big bang. And even if there were a big bang, there could have been a, a, a universe of non living things. Or, if there are living things, it didn't have to be us. And we could go on and on and on. 
right? And so we are the divergence from absolute purity. In fact, there are people today who take that seriously. There are people, for instance, who are doing uh, uh, Janet Gordon, it's a creolizing theory. She doesn't mean creole people. She means the admission that the moment theory has to relate beyond itself, it's always impure. And purity becomes a problem. Michael Monaghan argues this, but there are many versions of this argument. In my book, Disciplinary Decadence, I argue, for instance, that many people try to treat their disciplines like gods. And they treat their methods as if they were created by gods. And that means if your method was created by a god, you just have to apply the method to anything. And that's why we get into stupid debates of, you know, psychologists who argue against historians that historians are not psychologists. <laughs> and historians who argue against psychologists and sociologists that they're not historians. And sociologists who argue against they are, that, the them that they're not sociologists and economists who say you're not economists and natural scientists who say, well, you're not scientists. <laughs> and philosophers who say, yo, you're not philosophical. Right? In other words, all parties are guilty. And it's because they fail to realize that disciplines and theories emerge out of context of specific purposes. But they were never created by gods. And as human created phenomena, human created things, they require communication across human communities, which means in every act of communication, the person to whom you communicate is bringing something to the communication. And so, no, no discipline is ontological or complete. And this becomes the crisis. A, a, a very interesting. The crisis is not that theory is incomplete. The crisis is the failure to look into that because of its link to the effort to make the marketing of theory complete. You see the error? And that is a part of a very specific practice that is not just economic, it's not just historical, it's not just colonial, it's also theological, it's mythical, it's, like a, it's all of these things, you see? And what we forget is our capacity to articulate the relationships of those many things. And that those many things are not the entire, they're just, if you put all of the methodologies we have today, it would be a lot like talking about a little dot on this table. In other words, we have within us the capacity to build more relationships and continuing learning in our theoretical practice. Now, there's a, there's a part after this I have to get to, but I just want to stop for a moment because I know you may have a lot of questions. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Say your name again since the camera's on. Oh, sorry. It's Marilena from Sash, um, museum scholar. Um, I just don't see why it is a problem. Like, I become an interdisciplinary scholar because I moved through different kind of disciplines and was never happy enough with any of them. And like I was becoming a semiotician, I was becoming an anthropologist. There were so many things I was about to become, and I gave up on them because I was not happy with those. I was not happy with the methods. I was not happy with theories. So I was a custom quest towards better theories as tools to read reality and make the world a better place for other people as well. So I don't really see why it is a problem that disciplines are imperfect. Okay. With that one, I say brava. But there's more, there's more. Somebody else? Yes, your name?
because I, I need to understand how you see theory as political, or if you think that the theorizing, rather than creating a, a perfect theory, theorizing it can, can have how and, and when theorizing is important political. Is there a, a third? Because I want to make sure if you're thinking certain things are out. Is, is somebody else want to say something? Yes, your name, please. My name is Monica. Hi, so, Monica. when you talk about this shift from um, structuralist to critical and from genealogical structuralist or structuralist to decolonial, where would you locate sort of people like bell hooks or people like you know, Audre Lorde? Angela Davis, or other, even Sarah Ahmed Morris, the other feminists that are kind of in between. I don't know. Well, I don't even know if they're in between, but um, yeah, like fem I guess it's black feminists or post colonial feminists. Where, what, what are they? Okay. Um, yes, Bruno. No, Yalma. <laughs> no, is it? I'm sorry, Yama. Why did I say Bruno? There's Bruno. Is this my name? <laughs> <laughs> I know, no, that's not it. It's, it's, I, I put Bruno's face in my head. You see what I'm talking about, what you bring to something? It's not that I looked at Yama and I said Bruno. It's so an I apologize. I don't appreciate Bruno very much. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Bruno. Okay. Um, you know, I'm still you know, cooking some things here, but for me, there is something about ignorance, you know, which is a topic I'm very interested in which hasn't come up yet, and the link between ignorance and knowledge. And I wonder how some of the things that you describe are at least in part <coughs> related to the fact that for most of us it seems to be really difficult to assume our ignorance. That in the moment when, you know, not only do we try to impose our theory onto others, mm -hmm. but that the moment we put ourselves out there in a the, the true conversation, dialogue, whatever word you want to use, with others, we open ourselves up to, to realizing that we are incomplete, you know, and that we have been ignorant, and we continue to be ignorant, and obviously the, the connotation of ignorance continues to be negative. So for me, it's something about ignorance. They're wanting to believe that many of us still do things for the right reasons. You know, I, I wouldn't want to be cynical to say, I mean, you know, it's all fucked up and people are in there for their mother. I think some of us do it for the right reasons. But the moment we're, con uh, we're confronted with that ignorance, we're confronted with the fact that we're fellow, that we're not gods, it becomes increasingly fragile for our self-image, for, yeah, for our way of being in the world, for our possibility of being marketable. You know, so I, I, well, the first the first thing is uh, you may know two, there are two there are two things that I I just say right away because I'm going to get to it at, 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 at the end. The two things I would say right away is you may notice that I've actually been talking about bad faith throughout, hmm. and that one of the things that about bad faith is an investment of pushing pulling ourselves outside of relations. So when I talked about our relationship with reality, I did not talk about reality as a thing. I'm talking about reality as relationships, you see? And so your point about that page is well taken because all those examples, the way I talk about the market, the way I talk about the odyssey, is to create a kind of substance, a thing that is in and of itself complete and this is something that is affected thought quite a bit. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's connected to the domination of Cartesianism, right? The idea of two substances, how do you get to, to, to the other one? And, and it's there also in Perez's atomism in the market. Uh, although we look at many people, uh, Hobbes' work in Leviathan is perfect for the market because you're self, like bowling balls colliding, completely self-contained, right? And so, um, um, but the complicated thing uh, about bad faith is, you see, um, I try to examine this issue without always saying explicitly bad faith because I don't want to fetishize it as a category. Mm. I would rather us look through things and make the connections on our own the way you just said, okay? So because otherwise, I would treat that as a complete analysis that I just applied it. So I interrogate things in such a way that it will raise that question. The question um, about interdisciplinarity, in, in disciplinary decadence, I actually argue that interdisciplinarity is not the answer. And the reason is that 
you can be interdisciplinary while treating each discipline separately as complete. What I actually argue is that we need a form of transdisciplinary practice. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's the moment you make the disciplines communicate, the communication could only be possible if the discipline lets go of the presumption mm -hmm. of its completeness, which means the discipline becomes the way I described the professor. The discipline becomes a learning practice in communication with other learning practices. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. And so for instance, when I've written my books, it's very funny. Over the years, many people um, do not know what I had a PhD in. <laughs> there are people who read me in philosophy, people who read me in sociology and economics, and even, even in theoretical physics. Mm -hmm. And for, for me, that's a good thing. Because it means, I, 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 just to give you a sense, I never start a writing project or a problem from the question of what discipline I'm located in. I don't worry about it. I try to focus on the problem and find communities of people who are addressing it in ways that are useful. That's why if you look in the bibliographies of my essays or, or, or um, books, you will see, and, and here's the part that's broad striking, if I, in terms of my earlier criticism of, of what's called dominant philosophy departments, my bibliographies have no shortage of references to women writers, indigenous writers, African writers. It's not that I say, I'm going to put women and Africanism in my text. No. If you really just look for the people who look at the problems you're looking at, it's just not the case that a homogeneous community looks at that problem. So when I read people who claim to look at the same problem, and the only people they cite are a small set of European and white males, they could only have done that through ignoring the communities who look at that problem. It's not that there's something intrinsically wrong with being European and white male. It's just that we have to understand Europeans who are white males are co-participants in the search for knowledge, you see? And so if we come back, if we come to the, 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 the point about Angela Davis, Audre Lorde, Bell Hooks, uh, Bell Hooks emerged during the period of, of textual and genealogical post-structures. Uh, Audre Lorde, Lorde is more complicated because she is what Paget Henry would call a poeticist who was steeped in a very specific form of activism that was ahead of its time. Uh, the reason is because Audre Lorde what realized that sexual identities and gender identities were being treated the way I talked about disciplines, as closed. And she was, was uh, uh, arguing about what happens if you let go, then the possibilities of relationships are more. Many people misread, for instance, when she says the master's tools will not tear down the master's house. They think it means don't use tools like theory. That's not what she meant. She meant that you should remember that the enslaved had tools and that they and that they you can build different houses. When many of us study the history, for instance, of thought or even the question of material production, there are many things we we overlook because we have erase those histories. Many enslaved people, for instance, were skilled labor. They brought varieties of knowledge production to different parts of the world, which is why those places flourish. And then those places rewrite the history to say that exclusively the masters produced. It's a false history. When I'm in South Africa or in Senegal, you know, the, 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 the white settlers are always saying, well, if we go, look at all we built. And I always say, you ain't built shit. <laughs> you know, there are films showing these places being built. You see the white overlord walking. <laughs> but those people in there are architects. <laughs> they know how to build buildings, etc. It's just that there was a system imposed on them that when it's done, they don't own the rights over what they built. The cotton gin was built, was created by an enslaved person. The filaments and the light bulb 
was by a black person, the, I'm sorry, the assistant to um, um, Edison. I'm trying to remember his name now. Um, it'll come back to me. But all the way from soap to comb, not just material things. We could think about certain mathematical algorithms, or a lot of these things. In other words, as long as there are people <laughs> with functioning brains and minds, people build things. And this is not to say there aren't Europeans who build and create things. It's just the truth is people build things. And this is Angela Davis's point. This is why, what I'm leading up to. Angela Davis is very different. Angela Davis is what I call a thinker of generosity. She is one of the, she sees herself the way I describe the perpetual learner. Um, it's funny, I've, I've, I've known her for many years and just last summer we were in in, 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 in Paris for, you know, the um, 68 commemorations. But we were sitting down talking around 2 in the morning because Angela is a source of, ed she's endlessly energetic, <laughs> right? So, you know, she's one of these people where people are, oh, it's tired, it's, it's, but it's only 4 in the morning. <laughs> you know, that's how she is. So, and it struck me, she never stops learning. So she has never, she had never taken the position that that the, the organization of knowledge she works with is complete. So for her, her brand of communism and Marxism was not as an orthodox closed text. It was part of a larger story, which is why she wrote Woman, Race, and Class. She didn't take the position that the, the moral and economic arguments mean that you should act like moralistic subjects. She took seriously that human beings need to build livable worlds which is why she wrote on the blues, blues women, and aesthetics, okay? Angela Davis and, and I share a position, um, which is that, for instance, aesthetics should not be looked at as an add-on, and then you do real theory, although, you see what I'm saying? For us, it's part of the world people live in. It's why this room has pictures and decorations. They're not add-ons, it's the human way of articulating belonging into a world that didn't have to have us. And a lot of liberation practice is to create a world in which people belong. And so, um, the, the, and this is why today she, she is an example, Angela Davis, is in conversation with the, with the critical theorists and decolonial theorists and others, queer theorists, different men, but she never took the position that that her theoretical model is closed. And that's why I had to qualify always. I'm talking about dominant trends, mm -hmm. but there, there are individuals who, uh, who, who have always seen this problem. In fact, what's really striking is um, how well Frantz Fanon saw these problems. I mean, you know, he only lived 36 years. You know, he died in 1961. But he had a lot of these similar critical positions, particularly around human sciences and philosophy of psychiatry. Because Fanon noticed something, which is that, you know, his doctor, just, just very briefly, his doc, he wrote two doctoral dissertations. The, the first one was his accepted, which was, which was you know, in English, on the disalienation of Le Negre. I have to say Le Negre because it's not the equivalent the French term is not the equivalent as the, the English terms that are used. And that, as you know, became Pan Noir Mas Blanc, Black Skin White Mass, uh, at the suggestion of Francis Johnson, Johnson, right? Um, but then he wrote in two weeks a second dissertation that was accepted. And people say, wow, in two weeks. <laughs> but what they don't know is because Fanon had the attitude of constantly learning, the entire time he was a medical student, he was on his own studying people with Friedreich's ataxia, which is a spinal condition that can immobilize the body. So he had a lot of data. And that's why he was able to write that dissertation in two weeks. But the crucial thing in that dissertation, and this is what people miss, you see, Fanon was not only a clinical psychiatrist, he was a forensic psychiatrist as well, a medical detective. And but he took that, and he also studied philosophy of Merleau-Ponty. Mm -hmm. And he, 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 he took that to interrogate an interesting question. And this is pre-Foucault and a lot of these other folks, but a very important question. The question is this. 
the trend, if you're a positivist psychiatrist or a psychophysiologist, is that the cause of mental illness must be neurological. In other words, something must be wrong with your brain. What Fanon showed in his dissertation is that it's possible to have a neurological illness that does not manifest itself as a mental illness. And it's possible to have a mental illness that does not manifest itself as a neurological illness. And so in other words, it was, it was in looking at the problem of mental illness in its own term. And he had a lot to say, but the short version of it is he actually argues that there are societies that may not have mental illness at all. He actually argued that, in fact, a, there's a proliferation of mental illness in Euromodern society, and again, that would take some time, because Euromodern society is fundamentally narcissistic. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's not healthy to think about yourself all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because he noticed the difference between patients who are immobilized and are worried about their family and others, and the patients who are immobilized and say it's all about me. And those, the second, tend to manifest mental illness. Um, but anyway, um, so the answer is that there are, everything I'm saying, there's always been throughout, even in the 19th century, the 18th century, I could name people who saw these problems and identified them and outlined them, okay? Um, and, 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 and did so in very unusual, beautiful terms. Anthony Fernandez in Haiti in the 19th century. Um, Amo in, in Germany in the 18th, well, it wasn't Germany proper, but anyway, but in places like Halle in the 18th century. So there are always those who saw the problem. And also others, you know, not only people of color. France, that point I made about, we have to understand enslaved Africans as skilled labor. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Franz Boas argued that. Franz Boas, in fact, argued that one of the damages done to people of color, and specifically African-descended people, is the lie of a lack of contribution to the intellectual history and the technological history of our species. Because if our species is about 220,000 years old, you know that action didn't start happening in Europe until about 2,000 years, 2,500 years ago. That's a long time of, of creativity in Africa, from smelting iron to language to writing. You know, it's just all over the place. And his point is not that there's something intrinsically superior about Africans. It's just that Homo sapiens spent a lot of time in Africa. And Homo sapiens are pretty smart in the sense of what we use as markers of intelligence creatures. But there are other kinds of intelligence. But the ones we're talking about make sense because we are Homo sapiens. Technically, we're homo sapiens and, and a bunch mixed with Neanderthals and Denisovans. But the basic point is, you know, our creativity is different. Okay, let me get to the, the, the last part, and you'll see. Now, it should be obvious to you. I'm, all this time, I'm talking about theory, but I did not once say what I mean by theory. Okay? That's something that you should be thinking about, right? If you think about it, many people, when they talk about theory, they don't define theory. And here's one of the reasons why. The problem is, in order to define theory, you need to produce a theory. And the theory of the theory, you see the problem? It can have the same decadence that I'm criticizing. This is something Husserl noticed. It's something Franz Fanon noticed. It's something Arabindo noticed. Something Nishitani Kaiji noticed. It's something Gloria Alzadua noticed. There are many people all over the world who notice this problem. How do you talk about theory without bringing to it a theory that prejudices the outcome of what a theory is? Well, um, I'm going to briefly give a. I'm, I'm going to briefly try to talk about theory in a way that you may not have heard someone talk about theory. Uh, 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 the way Fanon did it was to say, I have to not presume a method. And of course, that creates the problem. What kind of method is not having a method? 
And, but the problem is if you start the method, then you have a whole theory that you're just applying. Mm -hmm. So you have to be willing to let go of the method and see where, what happens. Well, another way we could do this is to start, just tell a story about the theory. And to tell a story about theory, I want to start with a story, a story about allegory. Okay? And the moment I say allegory, there are people who may say, oh my god, you know, um, you know, what about, uh, you know, is this scientific? Is it, you know? But all allegories from allos mean something different. Okay? And agorain uh, simply means to speak openly. So it means to use something different through which to speak openly. Okay? This is one of the reasons why one of the most brilliant allegories ever was Plato's Allegory of the Cave. But why it's brilliant is not simply the basic story. You know, many of you know the story, right? You know, they're locked up in the cave, they see the shadows, they think it's reality, one gets out, blinded by the light eventually, can see, tries to go back, tell everybody, yo, there's an outside, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And they're like, no, nah, we don't believe it. Get back in your chains, all right? <laughs> But why it's brilliant is if you look at the story, the story is about outside, the allos. And this person tries to speak openly. So paradoxically, Plato's allegory is an allegory about allegory. I think it's really cool. <laughs> I was like, yo! Aristocles, I mean, that was his actual name. You know, Plato just means broad shoulders. But yo, that's amazing! But why is this an important story? Because every one of you know that Plato was very critical of the poets. His story about allegory was a story to prioritize truth and epistemic. Okay? Now, we, so, so we see that that's dominated what people want from a theory. Now we get to theory. Well, theory, its etymological roots are, are in the word theoria. But that doesn't tell you anything. Because <laughs> you're like, no, it just sounds like theory. Right? Well, what is the word theoria? Well, theoria is actually the bringing together of two words. One is Greek, but the other one is actually <coughs> North African, East African. Yeah. Okay? So let's start with the Greek speaking part. Thea is the Greek speaking part. Okay? And Thea means to see, to view. It's from, of course, what it makes it even more complicated. It's from Stea, from Steos, which today just means Zeus. So it's linked to God. And of course, in a world of secular theory, people don't talk about God, but it's linked to God. And so the idea, already there, is that fear is an effort to see what God sees. And you know God. If God sees it, it's true. Right? So if you're looking for epistemic and go outside, you want God's point of view. However, fear is also the word from which you get the word theater. Okay? And you've all been to a theater. You gather in a theater, and when you gather into the theater, you look to the skina, which just means stage. Okay? Well, what are you waiting for is for the stage to light up, and then the show begins. Well, the second part of the word theater is oran, ora, oria. Or, as in Hebrew, means light. Okay? It's to see the light. Okay? And this ancient, or a, it's the foundation for it's like oracle. Okay? Yeah. Right? Right? So it means, just as in a theater, you are to see what lights up on the skin of the stage. Okay? So that's the basic of the word theor, theora, from which you get the infinitive theoran. It means to view or to see what is seen. 
right? But for it to be seen, it has to be disclosed or lit. But it's not that simple because anybody who goes to a theater knows once it's lit up, you don't just go like this. You're actually doing this. Every moment when you're in a theater, you're making a decision on what to look at. You're paying attention to things. You see? Well, the word for decision was, or to decide, was klinan. And klinan is the word from which you get crisis. And crisis is the word from which you get krites, <coughs> which means critic or judge. And it's the word from which you get also criteria, the things that enable you to decide. You see how it's connecting now? So there is actually an important insight. Remember, my point when I was being critical about post-structuralism was, was, was about grandiose claims of what it can deliver. It doesn't mean that, that it was, there was no insight and contribution. Jacques Derrida, for instance, was acutely aware that every theoretical act required a decision. And he was going back to the ancient roots that to do theory is to make decisions, OK? To search for criteria. Now, it gets even trickier, though. If we stop there, we would still have a problem. Because then we'd be like Plato, because the, 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 the person who came made a decision, went out, saw the light, made a decision to go back, and a decision to communicate, right? The problem is, why did he fail? He failed because, and Plato, this is one of Plato's big mistakes, and it's dominated what became known as Western thought. It failed because Plato was against <coughs> myth. Today, the, the fight against myth has been so strong, today we use the word myth to mean that which is false. Mm -hmm. However, if you look at Theoria, and you think of Theoria as allegory, it means you have to put yourself in a position of estrangement, right? And go outside. So it's put you into the unfamiliar. Myth is from muthas, which means from the mouth. The mouth. And myth is all about familiarity, meaning, and because it's from the mouth, narrative. You notice I didn't say I'm going to give you a theory of theory. I said I'm going to tell you a story. I didn't presuppose, in other words, that to understand myth theory, what I was what at this point, the question that myth asks theory is whether theory has mythic foundations. And so the familiarity, familiarity requires repetition. That's why myths are repeated. A myth exists to be retold. But the secret of myth is the retelling changes the myth. That is why Plato was such an excellent myth maker. He opened the Republic with actually saying he's going to a, a festival, which is, you know, a ritual, a tradition, but it says <coughs> that's being held for the first time. Mm -hmm. right? It means, you, you see? And so in theory, you are actually articulating a relationship to reality and truth that in the communication is repeated. And Plato played with this in beautiful ways. In the symposium, it opens with a fellow saying to another fellow, I heard an astonishing story told to me by someone who said he heard it from somebody else, who heard it from somebody else, who heard it from somebody else, who heard it from somebody else who was there. Which means in the very opening, he's questioning the veracity of the story. But he's telling you the story is repeated, which means its repeatability 
means it has meaning. So the core issue becomes this. The problem with looking at theory purely as sight and what is looked at is that by itself, it lacks meaning. Can you see without meaning? Do you see the problem? When people try to offer theory without meaning, then it is, well, meaningless. It doesn't connect. It's not part of the world. The idea that the task of science is theory without myth for the human world will create incommunicable science. Mm -hmm. This is the big crisis of theory today. In an effort to be eradicated myth. Now remember, I'm not talking about falsehood. The way I'm using myth is meaning. The idea of meaningless theory as the model of theory creates a crisis of theory. And so if we're dealing with the fundamental communicability of theory, we now have to deal with the repeatable, narratable resources, which means theory must be connected and meaning must be connected to the practices of meaning, which includes music, includes art, it includes food, it includes ways of dealing with language. For instance, many of us think today to be scientific, we must write like we're writing a government manual. <laughs> but people used to do scientific writing in verse. People used to have many ways of doing scientific writing. There are all kinds of ways that we can communicate these ideas creatively. And so we come to the very, very last part. You know, I'm going to read a little quotation from you, for you, just to give you an idea. Since I brought up Plato, I think it would be good if I bring up um, this quotation. It's from Antef. Um, Antef wrote, the seeker of wisdom is the one whose heart is informed about these things which could be otherwise ignored. The one who is clear-sighted when he or she is deep into a problem. We already know that one. The one who is moderate in his or her actions, who penetrates ancient writings. Now this part I love because what I'm reading to you was written approximately 1900 BCE in Africa. Because every one of you have had a misrepresentation of the history of philosophy as beginning in among the pre-Socratics 2,500 years ago. When I teach my classes, I don't tell students that philosophy is, is, is thousands of years earlier than what they know in, 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 in um, the northern side of the, of the Mediterranean. I simply just assign the text because then on their own, if somebody comes and tells you, you know, philosophy began you know, 2,500 years ago, they said, well, I was reading something that was 4,000 years old. <laughs> and they could say who? You know, I think if we just tell our students these things, then we're proselytizing. And we're asking them to be passive learners. It's best if they read it and make their own, and learn it. You know. So we usually read this. But I find it remarkable that a 4,000-year-old text is talking about ancient writings. Hmm. That tells you how much was lost when there were the Christian purges of burning down all the libraries along the Mediterranean and Africa. What were being burnt were very old writings, okay? Whose advice is sought to unravel complications, who is really wise, who's instructed in his own art, or heart, who stays awake at night and he or she looks for the right paths, who surpasses what he or she accomplished yesterday, who is indeed, check out this one, who is wiser than a sage. Wiser than a sage, wow, right? Who brought his or herself to wisdom. Uh, the reason I, I put it in that, in, in that way is because this was a world in which the philosophers were known, they were female and male. It's just in their world, they didn't use gender categories the way we did, so we had to in reading them, figure out what, who, they, who they were. Um, who, right? Who asked for advice. Now, isn't that an interesting one? You're wiser than a sage. 
but you ask for advice. Isn't that connected to what I was saying in the very beginning about continued learning? And sees to that he or she is <coughs> asked advice. If you know something, share it. Okay, that's the inscription of Atta from the 12th dynasty in Kemet, uh, which is, just means the dark lands. It's a metaphysical word. Egypt is the Greek name for the area. And so the, the thing that's really striking here is it gives, it's, it gives us a way into thinking about theory that's very different. And we have to, what I, one of the reasons why I enthusiastically agreed to come is because I see that as the spirit of what's being done at Sinch. And I also see it because Bo and I have had debates and conversations around epistemology and so forth. And, and but I see what the project is here as in the spirit of unlocking theory from the shackles of these narrow-minded ways of looking at knowledge. So I'm going to close with just one, one etymological exercise that you might find useful. The word philosophy itself, we often hear, is the big defense is, you know, it's a Greek term. You know, they appeal to say they invented it. And the problem is, although philia is Greek, uh, Sophia isn't. Uh, it's the Greek pronunciation of sbeet. And sbeet is from sba, or saba. Uh, but what it is, is uh, in Greek, the ba was pronounced pa. The b was a pa, not the beta sound. And so, um, Sabaeit, which means translated as wise teachings, is translated to Sabaeit and Sophia. And you may notice when I told a story about theory before, already implicit in these etymologies I'm telling, is we have to get rid of the naive construction, the way we talk about coloniality and colonization of knowledge. Because we think when people colonize people, the people who are colonized become purely passive. We fail to see that people are always articulating their way of reality, and what these terms are, are hybrid terms of, what, of some people who emerge as colonizers, but the people who are colonized, like the word oria in Peoria, and now we're seeing the second part, philosophia, their articulations, I can give many examples of these, become part of the language. In fact, a lot of the Portuguese you speak today is connected to the, 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 the people whom Portugal spread out and, 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 and dominated for a while, but came back with the wisdom also of those people. And similarly, if you look in this word, sa, it's, you know, in most European languages, mo and today most people, they can't name more than three or four words for wisdom. Before, for instance, when I talk about the reket, from which you get my name, Ricardo, you know, there's a word that survived that's connected to that. It's called reckon. Reckon is a kind of, you remember I said intuitive knowledge? You say, I reckon it's, well, um, in Medinetra, in, in ancient languages, a lot is similar to the way we study genetics. You tend to know, for instance, potatoes from Peru, because although we, in here, we may eat four or five kinds of potatoes in Peru, there are more than 200 kinds of potatoes. We know coffees from Ethiopia because there are more than 100 kinds of coffees, blah, blah, blah. Well, in ancient languages, People did not have the reflective economy of expression. And so they would develop terms through the functions. So there would not just be knowledge. There would be knowledge of, a word would connect to knowledge and knowing how to drink from a glass of water. There would be the knowledge of knowing how to raise children. There would be the knowledge of knowing how to be a good host or a good guest. There would be the knowledge of knowing how to think about the principles of nature. There'll be, there'll go, the list goes on. And so, when I began to study ancient dead languages, some of them would have sometimes, just to talk about just one kind of knowledge that we tend to call wisdom, more than 36 words. And among them, but they often have a root, and the root word was sai, or sa, S-A. And it could be sai, 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 but as it builds up, some of it would talk about wisdom as knowing when conditions are, and it's survived. Conditions are satisfied. You see the root, sa. In Portuguese, what do you think of sabe or those kind of terms? 
That's root, it's ancient African. You can like all of those. And so in there, it means that these debates that try to say which one is the real, so forth, instead of looking at the relationship they have had and affected each other over time in history, and what we are to draw from that. If we begin to have that connection to the path and think about how we creatively our subsequent generations pass, then we begin to realize that we are setting the conditions if we would open up for not only the possibilities of different kinds of knowledge, but we also become in those possibilities new relationships for different kinds of beings. 